Thanks for tuning in to the Recovered Clinic podcast. I'm Dr. Schwalen, licensed psychologist and expert in the treatment of eating disorders. Uh, last week, we talked about eating disorders 101. Um, I shared a little bit about myself, and I also talked a little bit about what we do at the Recovered Clinic. Today, I want to talk about how does an eating disorder develop? So um, this is different than eating disorder 101. This is really what I think a lot of parents, families, and even individuals who struggle with an eating disorder wonder about. Um, the question is, how did this happen? Why did this happen? What could we have done differently? So one thing that I want to make sure I say before I even jump into the perfect storm or the development of an eating disorder is there's nothing that someone could have done or should have done to, to prevent it, okay? I say that because so many times... Parents and families will get stuck on the past. And what I want families to know they need to focus on is the fact that we know an eating disorder exists. It's not anything that anyone's happy about or, you know, it's not something that's easy for us to go through. But we can take the perspective of we do know it's here. How can we move forward to help our loved one achieve recovery. So being forward focused rather than backward focused is really the best use of your energy. With that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about what we do know about the development of eating disorders though, because I think it can help a lot of families realize that there's not one thing that they could have done or said differently to prevent the development of the eating disorder. So really, when we're thinking about eating disorders and how they develop, we think about them developing in a perfect storm. There's not just one factor that contributes to the development of an eating disorder. There are so many different things that contribute to it that we can't just find a switch, you know, that if, if they would just turn that one thing off, they would be able to start eating again. Or if we could just figure out exactly what caused it, we could go and fix that problem and everything would be okay again. It doesn't work that way. We also know that the person with the eating disorder doesn't choose to have an eating disorder. So they can't just eat because you told them to, or they can't just stop feeling guilty after eating a bunch of food. They really have a lot that they need to work through, and there's no one switch that they can just turn off and turn off. Because believe me, from working with as many clients as I have and seeing the real struggle that they go through, I know that if they could just turn a switch off, they would have done it a long time ago. So the first thing that we like to do is we, we, we think about eating disorder development from a biopsychosocial lens. What that means is that there's all these different factors. Some of those factors are biological, some are psychological, and some are social. And when you put all those factors together, they can create this perfect storm, and then you have an eating disorder development. So from the biological perspective, I like to talk about you know, stress versus genetics. The best way to really think about this is you know, in, the, in an example of maybe like high cholesterol, I think that's an example that a lot of people can resonate with. And it's an interesting example because it has a lot to do with how people think you can cure an eating disorder. So if you know that high cholesterol runs in your family, for example, that means you have a high genetic predisposition for high cholesterol. There's just a genetic component. It's hereditary. There's something about it and it runs in your family. In that situation, a small amount of stress or environmental factors can turn that gene on. So when you go to the doctor and the doctor knows that you have a high um, family history of high cholesterol, they might say, hey, let's make sure you make certain lifestyle changes to prevent high cholesterol from happening for you. 
So sometimes all, all that's needed is a high genetic loading and a little bit of environmental stress and an eating disorder might pop up. So there might be a very strong history of it in someone's family and someone is just genetically more sensitive or predisposed to developing it. There's another occurrence where maybe there's a very low genetic loading or a low genetic predisposition. So maybe no one in the family had an eating disorder before the loved one did. And in that situation, a lot more stress is needed to make that gene show itself or manifest. So what that means is there's psychological factors and social factors that could be playing into why all of a sudden there was room in your loved one's life for an eating disorder to be triggered. So we definitely think about that from the biological perspective is just what are the genetic components that could be contributing to why this eating disorder showed up in someone's life. The, the psycho part of the biopsychosocial model really has to do with psychological factors. So when we think about the psychological component with eating disorders, we know that eating disorders very commonly co-occur with different psychological conditions. So for example, anorexia very commonly co-occurs with depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, and all different kinds of anxiety. So panic disorder, social anxiety, different phobias, we also know that substance abuse and substance dependence is a really commonly co-occurring condition with anorexia. For bulimia, for example, we know that bipolar disorder really has a, a high co-occurrence, and so does substance use disorder. We also know that people with eating disorders tend to have certain types of personality traits. And I really like talking about these with my clients and with their families because it's really important to understand that personality traits are a little bit different than psychological disorders. So personality traits are those things that um, people are born with. Um, I've talked to many parents before who've said, you know, we had twins and they couldn't be more different than night and day. So... There are a set of twins that are born, you know, together, and one may, be, may have come into the world very laid back and relaxed, and the other one may have come into the world extremely anxious, a little bit more uptight, or um, just kind of more stressed out easily. And parents say this not just about a set of twins, but they say it about siblings in general. Their kids couldn't be more different from each other. And so those are the things that, you know, children just kind of come into the world with or certain personality traits. Well, we know about people with anorexia or even highly controlled types of eating disorders like ARFID, which I talked about last week, um, or even atypical anorexia. The personality traits that kind of go along with those disorders tend to be more of perfectionism, high anxiety, um, very, very motivated to succeed, and just kind of high achieving. And so there is nothing bad about those personality traits. In fact, those personality traits can create a very successful person in the future. What I love to talk about with clients is the fact that there are ways to hone those traits in and actually make them work for you rather than against you. And so part of learning coping skills when someone has an eating disorder is recognizing those personality traits in them and then refusing to allow the eating disorder to manipulate them and take advantage of them. Because an eating disorder like anorexia might take someone who's focused on perfectionism and say, well, you ate more than you should have this morning and so now you are a failure. We're going to go ahead and spend the whole day in punishment. You're going to exercise and you're going to burn as many calories as you need, as you can, because you have failed. So it's like this all or nothing type of mindset. Um, what I like to talk to clients about and families about is actually let's look at that and say, you know what? 
let's examine this perfectionism and see how we can find some balance so that we can use this personality trait when it's really important to use it, maybe like to get um, things accomplished or to get good grades, but let's not let it run this person down to the point of burning out. And then obviously to making decisions that are not good for their health. When someone has bulimia, we know that really common personality traits can include more impulsive types of behaviors or acting out behaviors. We also know there's a personality of kind of stuffing things down and maybe not dealing with things and then being more unregulated when it comes time to express or feel those feelings. And so a lot of emotional dysregulation can be a part of bulimia. And I like to describe it to my clients and families as if you think about how their eating disorder is working, they're kind of binging, so they're kind of stuffing down a lot of stuff, and then they're purging, they're letting it all out in a very unhealthy way. And so it's this real up and down kind of dysregulated way of experiencing the world. And that's exactly how people with bulimia experience their eating disorder. So there's obviously different biological and psychological components to eating disorders. And I'm not saying everybody who has more of that high achieving personality is going to go out and develop an eating disorder. I'm just saying we do know that sometimes in the case of an eating disorder, these things can contribute to it. The social component is extremely interesting to me. So the social factors that play into the development of an eating disorder are very, very they're just varied and there's many of them. So when I think about social components, I think about, you know, full systems. I think about the social culture of the world we live in. I think about the culture of the country we live in. In fact, in the United States and in most Western countries, the thin ideal of beauty is what, is what currently stands. So people are inundated with images of, you know, to be beautiful means to be thin um, on a daily basis. And family values are also part of that social component. So with or without saying it, it may be a covert or more overt type of family value. Maybe to be thin or to be small is more acceptable. Um, there are a lot of times when, you know, parents will say, well, we've never talked about that as a family in an overt way. But then kids will be able to pinpoint and say, well, I grew up watching my mom look in the mirror and always be unsatisfied with what she saw. Or I grew up, you know, watching my dad park really far away uh, wherever we went so we could take extra steps. Or it was always better to take the stairs than the elevator. Or I was told not to have too much sugar because it could make me fat. And so with those small types of things that children pick up on, Somehow, some way, they got the message that being thin and being small was more acceptable than anything else. We also know there's a huge social component when it comes to peers and acceptance in the school setting and amongst social circles. And so social media is a huge influence. Um, girls especially and boys will compare themselves to one another um, boys tend to focus more on being athletically built, and, and that's how they kind of equate with that thin ideal. So we just know there's tons of images and tons of messages that are out there. I mean, you can be going to the grocery store and checking out, and there's, you know, 10 different magazines with the same cover on it as how to get the bikini body, you know, for the summer, or how to burn off that Thanksgiving dinner in the winter. There's just so many new diets out there. There's so many new fads. And this is really hard, too, because we live in a society where one of the most common questions is, what's for dinner? I mean, all we do is talk about food or think about food, and then there's all this either very hidden or very obvious pressure to not eat <laughs> because of the thin ideal. So I kind of alluded to the fact that um, not everyone that has, you know, high achieving kind of type A personality traits are going to go on to, to develop an eating disorder. What we know is that according to the sociocultural model of eating disorders, so not everyone is going to go and develop an eating disorder. In fact, it's, it's only about 1% of 
um, the United States population that has an eating disorder. But when we think about, like, how does that come about? Like, how does it happen? We know that everybody in our country, especially, has been exposed to the thin ideal, whether it's through TV shows or magazine ads or billboards on the highway or social media. There is some exposure to the thin ideal. What we also know is that most people are going to internalize that thin ideal. And big companies and marketers very much understand this. They know that once that internalization of the thin ideal occurs, the very next thing that happens to people is body dissatisfaction. So if you put 10 people in a room, nine out of those 10 people, hands down almost every single time, you're going to find out that nine out of those 10 people are dissatisfied with their body. There's something about themselves that they wish was different, and it's going to happen nine out of 10 times. So if, if that many people have internalized the thin ideal, and if that many people have body dissatisfaction, how come more people don't go on to develop an eating disorder? Well, first, let me speak to the fir- like that, you know, that big majority of people that have body dissatisfaction. It is more normal than not, as I've already established, that people just don't like the way they look. I kind of mentioned that marketers really capitalize on that because they sell products and they make advertisements to um, appeal to that dissatisfaction. So if you buy our product, then you'll, you'll have better, you know, whatever you're looking for. And marketers also tend to target the people in our society with money. And the people in our society with money are the grown-ups. So what we know from a pediatric perspective, because I always take that perspective since I am specialized in that, is that children are exposed to those same ads that are really meant for the people in our, in our society who have the money to spend. But because they're seeing all of those things the billboards, the magazine covers, all of that stuff, it is so, so important for parents to make that a topic in parenting on a regular basis. And so I think I will be speaking on that in the near future about how do you establish and build critical thinking skills in your child and loved ones so that they have somewhat of a filter when they're taking in all of those scenes for what the thin ideal is and what creates body dissatisfaction. But let's get back to how an eating disorder forms. So we have the exposure to the thin ideal, we have the internalization of the thin ideal, and then we have body dissatisfaction. But not everybody goes on to develop an eating disorder. So who usually does? This is where some of those personality traits come in and where some of those other factors play a role. We know that people who go on to to, um, develop a full-blown eating disorder tend to have much more anxiety or like a sense of neuroticism. So maybe they're really rigid or they have a lot of high control types of behaviors. And they tend to also have some self-objectification. So what that means is they do a, a lot of what they have seen people do to their to bodies in our society, which is they self-objectify it. So they make um, they make their body about parts rather than a full being. So they get focused maybe on how one part of their body looks, and that's all they can think about. We also know that people who go on to develop eating disorders tend to be more perfectionistic. So I'm talking more about the traditional eating disorders. Remember last week I kind of broke it down. I'm talking more about anorexia, bulimia, even atypical anorexia. These are the types of traits that we see in someone who's going to go on to develop a more traditional eating disorder. So someone who's perfectionistic can have two types of perfectionism. They can either have self-oriented perfectionism, which is the drive or motivation that comes from within to be perfect, And then they can also struggle with socially prescribed perfectionism, which is when someone tries to be what they think others want them to be. And so if you have both types of perfectionism, 
So this internal drive to be perfect and then also a very strong motivation to meet the expectations of others, it's like pouring fuel on fire. This is the worst combination of perfectionism that someone can have because ultimately they stop living for themselves, they forget what's really important to them, and they're always trying to please others and really fit a mold that's very difficult to fit. Another huge part of why people go on to develop an eating disorder, and I see this really in almost every eating disorder that, that I've treated, is a sense of shame. So it's really important to understand, like, what's the difference between guilt and shame? And I've found that a lot of times clients and families don't really understand the difference. So I just like to describe it as, you know, guilt is this feeling that you did something bad. You know, maybe just a real innocent example. Maybe when you were a kid, you went to an eating disorder, um, sorry, not an eating disorder, a candy store, <laughs> and you stole some candy. After you stole the candy, you thought to yourself, I feel really bad about that. You know, like, I don't really want to do that again. So the guilt is actually very useful. Um, it can serve a purpose in making sure that we don't do something in the future that made us feel very uncomfortable or that we, that we thought was morally wrong. But shame, on the other hand, is the sense of, I'm, I didn't do something bad, I am bad. So that thing I did makes me a bad person. I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm never going to own, I'm never going to measure up to what I'm supposed to be. That's really what shame is. And in eating disorders, we tend to see a lot of shame in our clients. So all this to say, I think that it's really, really important. And the point that I really want to drive home is that there is not just a single cause for eating disorders. We can't pinpoint exactly what it is or when it happened or anything like that. What we do know is that the more factors that we can identify, the more likely an eating disorder is to occur. And so in treatment, what we like to focus on is educating on the different factors and then, you know, with families and individuals, we try, to work, we try to work on and affect those factors that we have control over. We live in a society where it's very much believed that dieting is good. Um, we live in a society where it's very much believed we need to label foods as, uh, as healthy or unhealthy and attach moral value to things like, like food being good or bad for us. And I have so much to say about that, and I will in future episodes. But I just, I say that to just hone in the fact that it is very hard to know, you know, what is, is true and right for us and what we should be influenced by. And so developing those critical thinking skills is so important, but also remembering to have some grace and to know, like, we don't always know the answer. And we don't always know exactly what caused an eating disorder. And so that's why it's important to stop trying to find that one thing or to feel that shame or that self-blame for the development of the eating disorder and understand that there are so many factors involved from the biological, the psychological, and the social perspective. So that's what I have today. Um, the perfect storm in the development of eating disorders. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and I can't wait to see you next week.